The right habits put you in control of your health, relationships, mindset, and more. But most people lack the tools to stick with those habits long enough to see results. That is about to change. Welcome to the Unshakable Habits Podcast with your host, habit change specialist and speaker, Stephen Box. Join us each week as experts share their stories, experiences, and insights and give you the tools to build unshakable habits so you can live life on your terms. It's time to take your habits from unsustainable to unshakable. Hey, welcome to the Unshakable Habits Podcast. I am your host, Stephen Box, and I am joined today, as you can see, by Tracy Lamore. Tracy, thank you for joining me today. Hello, hello. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to share your story with everybody. I had a chance to hear it when we talked before, and it really is a fascinating story. But I want <laughs> I want people to hear your story through a little bit different context. And we do this with all of our interviews. It's called the Unshakable Habits Framework. And the reason why I want to put everything through this framework is that's what's going to allow our audience to take your story and see how they might be able to apply it to their life. Because I'm assuming that not everyone out there listening wants to become a publicist. <laughs> so the first part of our framework is you have to create. A so I vision. highly recommend it. No, sorry. <laughs> yes, very highly recommend. <laughs> so no, they, so the first part of our framework is to create a vision. Now, a vision is different than a goal because goals are something that we're chasing after a very specific outcome. And truthfully, we don't have a lot of control over outcomes. Visions, on the other hand, we have a lot of control over and they're a little more flexible. In order to reach that vision, you're going to need some skills. So you either have to already have them because you've developed them somewhere else or you have to develop them, which leads to the third part of the framework, which is. What are those repetitive actions you're going to take to build up those skills? Because when you do those things, what you end up with is unshakable habits. So, Tracy, we can actually kind of start a little bit with your vision. Because your vision is something that kind of came to you a little bit later. And I'm, I'm kind of putting this in a little bit in reverse order. So tell us about your vision as a publicist. And how you went into that. But then right after that, take us back to the beginning of that process. Okay. So my vision as a publicist from when I started conceiving of myself as a publicist and putting myself out professionally to be paid as a publicist. From that point, which was about a decade ago, my vision was um, similar to what it is now, it's, which was helping using the skills that I had developed um, that most people do not have to break the media barrier. That most people perceive. So most people don't have any real understanding of how to get into the media. When I say media, I mean everything from podcasts to the mainstream media that we grew up with, television, radio, newspapers, magazines, you know, that. So how to get into the public eye beyond social media. Everyone's gotten really good at using social media platforms. And of course, it's an essential part of marketing. But what I do as a publicist is what we call earned media, which is not Paid for its editorial versus advertorial, which is a huge part of the way people need to start thinking in order to be successful in that realm. So yeah, so basically, I help people get into the media. Ele I elevate and celebrate the good work that people are doing, whether they're creatives, whether they're filmmakers, actors, authors, public speakers, or entrepreneurs from across the board. And currently, people are surprised when they when they hear that because they don't think of entrepreneurs as needing publicists, but in you know today's world, you really do. So no matter what you do, there is um, media opportunity for you in mainstream media and in niche media, as well as, you know, podcasts and new media. So you have to think beyond social media. Yeah, it's, it's funny you, you mentioned that because one of my business mentors, one of the things that he always says is there's two rules. Rule one, do a good job. Rule two, rule Rule two, if I can talk today, is make sure everyone knows about it. And that's exactly what you help people do, is you help make sure that people know about the good job that they're doing. And it's huge. And just to just put that in perspective, as you just said, that was it's a great quote. 
you know, Bill Gates, whatever people think about Bill Gates, but he, you know, he's, there's a quote from him that I love that said, if I had, if I was down to my last hundred dollars, I'd spend it on PR. And that's for the reason that you just mentioned, you know, you can have the best thing in the world, but if nobody knows about it, then it's not the, then just you and your friends are the best thing in the world. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're not making a million dollars. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's hugely important. So, so talk to us about how did you get into this field? Like what you, you mentioned that you already had these skills. So where did these skills come from? Well, they did not come from the traditional path. Let me tell you, my friend, the traditional path of PR <laughs> is normally four to five years in, the, you know, it's actually a university or college or whatever it is, actually four year university course. And uh, the other traditional path is through the media. So a lot of times you'll see publicists, they are, you know, they'll be working in journalism for a while and then they stop working or whatever and then they go work for a company and, because they, it's, you know, that media messaging, understanding what the newsroom wants, these two skills from journalism to PR are usually translatable. Especially if you're a journalist and you've been seeing what publicists have been doing for years and you're like, ah. <laughs> right? So, but uh, the way I got into it was I was a t- in entry level sales, you know, marketing, just your basic hadn't gone to school for it's your basic um go-getter sales and marketing job whatever right out of high school kind of stuff that i was doing and um my husband dave parkinson and i had had a radio show on college radio in toronto which was right across the city so it was real radio real fm radio a year or two before that we had been reporting like actually reporting and doing interviews about issues relating to social justice you know whatever different issues um around the city and internationally and when we left that radio show um, because it went to a music format, we were more interested in the issues. We didn't have that anymore, so we were just doing our regular sales jobs with the early days of the internet, though. So we thought, oh, well, we can still have a voice. We'll make a little website and, you know, just share things that we care about, that we think should be elevated. And very quickly, we found we found out we're not looking for anything like that. We had never been involved with the death penalty or any kind of activism on that regard before. We were in Canada, nothing to do with even in the States. And um, suddenly we learned about the case of a man who was saying he was factually innocent, a man named Jimmy Dennis, who was on death row in Pennsylvania. Just to let people know, so that he was factually, truly innocent, was fact, was released 20 years later in 2017 after he'd done 25.5 years. He's now, if you Google his name, an R&B artist doing really well with and people are going to be hearing about him more and more. And that's that's, that's a promise, but I can't say more than, about that right now. Anyway, um, but when he when we first started, nobody knew about him. He was literally asking for help. He paid 20 bucks or something to be featured on a little corner of the internet. He was saying, I'm not looking for a pen pal. I'm not looking for a girlfriend. I'm literally looking for like help. I'm innocent on death row. So my husband and I were like, huh? how innocent can this guy be? And I don't know. What drew us to, you know, when someone asked, why would you get involved? I think, you know, yeah, we were activists, but also because I think the essential component is because we'd had that radio show not long before. So we were in that mindset of tell us about it. You know, what is this information? So we literally physically wrote a letter and sent it off to death row. And when he wrote back 28 pages on either side, you know, 28 years old, 28 pages, um, 28 pages on either side tightly written with all kinds of detail and whatever legal documentation he had in the cell, it was enough for us to be like, oh my God, that is crazy. And so, you know, not that we were big heroes or anything at the time, we weren't, we didn't have a penny to rub together. We weren't lawyers. We were certainly not publicists, but you know, we made this dumbass move. I'm writing to this person. And what do you do when you get that back from that? You know, all that heartfelt, please help me, you know, 28 pages. All that. Was it, is it just, oh, that was an interesting read. What, you know, so what do we do now? So we have no way to help. So we thought, well, maybe if we put it up on the interwebs, somebody would be a lawyer will come or somebody with money will come. So my husband learned to make a website and I learned literally on the Alta Vista to age myself how to write a press release or immediate release, three paragraphs. And we put it out internationally. And that was the beginning. And that, you know, and end of the story by saying we ended up being on CNN, not just for that case, but we ended up educating ourselves about the whole death penalty and then somehow these 28 year olds with no legal experience and no media experience ended up on CNN, MSNBC, Court TV, A&E. And it still took me another 11 years before the point of your question. It hit me because all that time I just kept getting major, major media, Der Spiegel, National Enquirer, People Magazine. But all that time we were just doing our sales job, our marketing job. We weren't getting paid for any of that. 
that was just justice work we were doing went to work and then it literally hit me when i was 41 years old 41 10 years ago when i was about to make another call hi it's tracy calling from something i really don't care about for something you really don't care about for another 20 calls an hour and i wish i could remember what i was thinking the moment before but i clearly remember going wait a minute Huh. wait a minute, isn't that stuff I've been doing all this time, a, a publicist? It just hit me that i have been super successful in media messaging. And from that moment, I just started researching, well, how could I do this publicist thing? I was a freelancer for a couple of years. Then I had a general partnership for five years. And then we incorporated during COVID. So now I'm all the managing director of a corporation and stuff. Just life comes at you fast, right? <laughs> and it's so sorry, but it's hard to tell that story in a little, like, I've, you know, like, how do you tell? Then there was this guy on death row and I, I wow, let me. <laughs> so that's how it becomes back to the business story. So like you said, most people don't have, you know, whatever. They don't have, have that story, but they all have a passion, something you love, something, you know, you care about, something you're good at. that You never probably thought could actually yes. be your day job. It, it's, it's interesting because you really just brought up two points. Um, one is something that I actually made a video about recently and something is another guest that I interviewed recently brought up. And the first one is I talk about the importance of being able to fill in the blank of scent of this sentence. I'm the kind of person who. And for you, when you saw that little $20 ad or, or whatever you want to call it on the Internet, and you decided to reach out, like you said, you had no legal experience, you had no media experience, you had no reason to reach out to this person other than just you saw yourself as the kind of person who helped other people. And this was somebody who, you know, needed help, obviously. So for whatever reason, you took that little desire to say, I'm the kind of person who helps people to say, I'm going to reach out and try to help this person. And that ultimately led to what my other guest referred to as an adjacent opportunity. And that's essentially that you were going down this path with no intention of ending up where you were. But then all of a sudden a light bulb goes off one day and you go, wait a minute. This thing is kind of like that thing. I, I could probably do that. I was so not focused on those possibilities. It literally was like 11 years later. 11 years after getting like continual major media success <laughs> and then, that's great bye thanks for the interview we got to get to my day job <laughs> so it never even occurred to me because we were already being successful at what our goal was yeah. which was getting that message out that yeah. was the goal the goal wasn't like getting that message out so that we can elevate ourselves right yeah it it was never it was never about you it was about the person that you were serving. So it's also interesting to me because it goes back to this idea of a difference between a goal and a vision, right? So when you had a vision of yourself as someone who helped people, that opened up this opportunity for you to go do exactly that. It allowed you to reach out and help somebody. That's interesting. And, I never thought about it that way in terms of either myself or other people, but you know why people, but that's a really good, really good point. I'm going to incorporate because I, al I always make the point where people are like, Oh, wow. You did. I don't mean to interrupt, but just yeah. when they yeah. say, Oh, you made the, you know, Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. Yay. 20. You're so awesome. You did this 20 year campaign to, you know, and I'm always like, stop, stop. Because I mean, obviously it, it, it was epic. You can't tell that story without saying that was an epic thing to do. Okay. Yeah. But you know what? You don't feel that way. Number one, if it was epic, it was Jimmy Dennis that kept us together like a post manager to do it all. Number one, credit yeah. to Jimmy. Cause how do you do that? Right. Yeah. But also why, you know, why did we do that for 20 years? Why does anybody do anything? You know what? I think more because I don't think, you know, it's not because Tracy's awesome or nicer than other people or kinder than other people. But like you said, that's an empowering thing. She, A, I thought about myself as a person who does that stuff. But why did I think I, because I think some people might think of themselves, they think of themselves as nice and kind and look at they help people. But why don't they do stuff like that? Because they don't feel empowered. They don't feel like they could actually make a difference in something like that. So we don't do, you know, we're not going to, I mean, that's just crazy to think you could. So you don't. Right. Yeah. And, and that comes down to, you know, that the next part of that framework, which is, you know, we talk about the skills, right? Because you had to develop certain skills. 
and you didn't worry about, oh, yeah, I can't do this because I don't have these skills. Instead, you kind of went out and did them. Now, something I always try to point out to people, because this is the really interesting thing about when we're trying to create, you know, new habits in our life is we kind of fundamentally know this stuff, right? And really successful people, what I found is that they've gone through this framework just almost either on accident or just by, you know, coincidence, right? It's it's totally. never this like planned out thing. Really? Now, That's it, common? It's very common. You, you would be surprised. I've I've yet to have one single person that I've interviewed who's actually said, now watch the next person I interview is going to say this and I'm going to have to make sure I put their interview after yours. <laughs> But the, I've never had somebody go, I had this 10 year plan and I, you know, sat down and I wrote out this list of skills. Now, had they known about the format, had they realized that that was there, I'm sure a lot of people would have done it and they would have been successful with it. Because- but I wonder, though, because, you know, you also see there's a million books and a billion books and a billion people who do that all day long. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they are super successful. And I'm sure, like you said, some of them are. But 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 I don't think that's that's the juice. You know, because like yeah. you said, a lot of us haven't done that. Yeah. But I think yeah. we're strategic and we take advantage of the opportunities that come our way. Not like a, in a planned, I'm going to take advantage. Of, but I mean, we're just open hearted, yeah. open minded. We we communicate well. So people, you know, come to us mm-hmm. with things. You know what I mean? If yeah. you're if you're open. And yeah. genuine, and, things happen. And if you're out there. And one thing that I see a lot is. Most of the people I've interviewed their desire to be successful has had pretty much nothing to do with the awards or the money or anything else. It's almost always about serving other people. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, every now and then there are other reasons. It's usually things like that person's had something traumatic happen to them or, or something like that. And they're trying to be, get above it or something. Yeah. They're they're trying to get above it, but but no, I hear what you're saying. That's true. That's and that that resonates too because I know people where that's been the case and they're like no I'm gonna prove myself and you know and that's just like you know but like you're saying that's so true the, now that I'm thinking about it the super successful people that I know they're not on that that track of like just like I never was like how can I benefit from this how can I benefit how can I be I was never like that and I still say maybe I'm naive I don't know I didn't go to business school but maybe maybe I'm naive when I say people what I I say the same thing as a as the head of a corporation as I did as a young activist who kind of looked at scans of corporations, you know, yeah. which is people, I used to say, hey, people are the bottom line, buddy, people, not yeah. money. And I still say that. I still want my company to be, because we are, and I still say that to business audiences now from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Who is, you know, because I was right as a young activist in that perspective. Who is your customer? Mm-hmm. People, people. Who are your employees? People. So don't forget, who are the frontline workers especially? Don't forget who's the face of your company yeah. that everybody sees people so if you're not thinking about people and you're just thinking about profit then i don't know i guess some people make profit that way but it's not my game yeah i'm sure that there's people out there that have made made quite a bit of money by just stepping on everybody and treating everybody poorly but But um, you know is that really a life you want to live it's not the life i want to live so no i don't want to profit i don't want to you know get rich by pushing all my neighbors like what kind of is you know do you want to be the only rich guy in the block or the only guy there in the block where everyone starves or is that what you want? Is that even a nice picture? Jeez. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, not my world. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, you know, one thing that is interesting to me about your story is when you talk about the difference between a vision and a goal. So you, your vision was you wanted to be someone who helped people and you didn't really know exactly what that was going to look like. You didn't like, Playing it all out like, oh, you know, I want to be sitting on the beach in 20 years writing letters to whatever, <laughs> you know, like you yeah. didn't have that. That'd be a weird combination, granted, but <laughs> you didn't have like this vision of what that necessarily looked like. You just knew you wanted to help people. Yeah. And when you started putting goals around your vision and and they were great goals, like to get somebody out of prison, that's that's a fantastic goal, right? To, to, get an innocent man, said. <laughs> yeah, to get an innocent man out of prison, let's be, yeah. let's be clear. We don't want to just get anybody out. Factually innocent. Yeah. yeah. Actual factual innocent. Yeah. So, you know, when, when you look at that goal, which you were able to accomplish, but that goal also 
kind of limited your vision because you didn't see the other possibilities because you were so focused on that one thing. Mm-hmm. And, and to a lesser extent, I think a lot of times many of us maybe have this tendency to do this. We get caught up on the outcome related type stuff and we fail to see the bigger opportunities that are in front of us. That's and, a great, yeah, that's a great point. You could even yeah, take that for an example of like my daughter is going, her goal is medical school, right? Which she's going to do one way or the other. But like when you, someone was telling her, as you start going your medicine path, you'll have like one vision in your head about what you, what you plan, right? But you know, you, as you go through that path, you're going to run into a whole bunch of things that you never even thought of and different avenues. So if you're just completely closed off, you'll probably get where you're going. It'll be a good thing. Fine. But you may never know about all those other little potential lives you could have lived. If you see the other possibilities, right? Yeah. And and when I go back into your story here, what I see is even when you shifted and you did something that was really more about you, you know, like starting your company, becoming a publicist, even that still had to do with serving other people. It still fit your original vision. How do I help? Yeah, like, yeah, and not just in the fact that it's a service company, but I mean, it very much is still like I'm very proud that you can. But I, the activist me, twenty year old, whatever, would still be proud of where I am today. Not just because that, like I said, people the bottom line, but even in the projects that I choose, I say no to a lot of projects because I don't. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really align with not just what my brand is, but my brand is me. It's got my name on it, and I was an activist first, and I, you know, so you're not going to see me representing Philip Morris Tobacco Company. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless you know, unless Philip, I mean, you know, hey, they couldn't lose. They're they're putting nine billion dollars into some campaign that completely aligned with, uh, you know, something I've been working with my whole life. If they're going to end the death penalty or something, okay, then I'm gonna, I'll, I'll stand with them on that and support that action. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That maybe that's a different story. I don't think they're going to do that, but hey, if you want me as the publicist, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. But no, you know what I'm saying, though? Like, I I'm, I don't, yeah. I choose not to do work for politicians because even when they get elected, it's just a difficult game, even if they're awesome. It's, I choose, I like to stand with, you know, I want to always be proud of the message that I put out on the in the world. Yeah. Something that interested me when we talked before, um, and, and I'm bringing this up now because it ties in with you talking about the people that you work with. We talked earlier in this conversation about sometimes people don't do things because they're not confident in themselves. Kind of talk to me a little bit about when you have these clients who have accomplished a lot of things, they've got all these awards, they have all this stuff that's worth bragging about. And I remember you telling me that sometimes you'll write stuff for them and they'll go, man, you make me sound so good, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, So talk to me about the fact that sometimes even people who have all the success still don't think they're worthy of it. Yep. And they call that imposter syndrome now, which is something that they use a lot when they talk about women in business, but it's exactly what you're talking about. They, whether you want to use that phrase or not, it's exactly the thing. We, we, you know, we we don't see ourselves as the same way we see the people that in our minds, we elevate the celebrities, the people getting awards, you know, people in your own industry getting awards, people on television. So I always say, it's a, it's a, and I see that you know in microcosm when these hugely accomplished people in whatever realm they give me their bi- their details they have a, it's not a they may be a bio or they might just give me their their resume or CV or something and I'm writing a one pager out of it and I'm not embellishing I'm not making anything up I'm not going other places on the internet to search for things they didn't give me none of that I'm literally just writing a one pager based on the information they give me. And, you know, the kind of language you would use writing a one page or a magazine article or bio, like, you know, talking about their work. And I, I mean, literally four or five different times, different people, different industries have literally used the same words to say to me, oh, my God, you made me sound so good. And I'm always like, you stop right there. Perception, problem. you know, I didn't make anything. I wrote it up the way you're used to reading about other people. That's all I did. No embellishment. No, I mean pretty words and that it sounds nice but nothing nothing like it lying you know what i mean and nothing even exaggerating just well worded the way you're used to reading a profile of another person but this yeah. time it's about you and you're like look at me i sound good i'm like yeah exactly now you see yourself the way you see other people for a minute think about that 
hold that moment and use that confidence Mm -hmm. you know and like i always say to people when i when i talk to any entrepreneur or or expert or in whatever their field is and i'm like oh my gosh that's great you're not doing any how come you're not doing any media about that how come you're not being interviewed and then they look at me like uh, you know, like, why, why would they, uh, you know, they don't understand, why would they do me? And they say, well, you're an expert, right? And if you, well, yeah, but, well, no, yeah, but if you're not an expert, are you a scam then? Because I see you're taking people's money, you've got all these ads, people should give you their money. Of yeah. course you're not. No, no, no. No, exactly. You're an expert enough that you believe people should give you their money because mm-hmm. you're better at what you do than they are. Take that same confidence and realize exactly that you have that knowledge, that expert knowledge, and that's what media needs. And that's what, and once you get your head around being advertorial or editorial, not advertorial, so you're not running an ad for your company when they ask you to do a sound by, you know, then you, you're gold. Just like yeah. I'm the celebrity publicist now because I know how to get myself out there and how to talk about what I do. I'm, you know, the chef comes to me, they're a celebrity chef after a while because we'll get them quoted in here and there in 15 other places. But, yeah. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden, yep. it's elevating. And like I always say, it's not spin. I'm not a spin doctor. I don't do that. All about, I'm the genuine publicist, for real. Um, but it's all about elevating and celebrating. I made that up just in a podcast one day. just popped out. But like, it's exactly right. Elevating and celebrating all the amazing things that whoever is doing. And making them realizing, clearly. Yeah, and, and you know, one thing that I love about that. And this actually ties in with something that I teach people all the time. I don't use your exact terminology, but I'm, I might borrow it from you. Um, Please, yeah. <laughs> but, but we need we need to get people to elevate and celebrate themselves more often. Because here's the thing. I want you to share with us how many people that knew, like, let's say, like, 12-year-old Tracy. How many of those people would have said, Tracy is going to one day be an international award-winning publicist? Probably not a publicist. They may have said a writer or, uh, and also, funnily enough, people from high school remind me, do you remember I always told you you were going to be famous in drama class? Apparently, I always had that. I, I didn't feel like I was, and I was, you know, the fat girl. But I mean, I was never shy. And I was, I guess I always had somewhat of the, <laughs> but whatever take me as i am which is attracted to people you know what i mean no matter who yeah. you are if you're like not shy and you're not you're willing to stuff you give other people that confidence to be themselves too so i've always you know been that so yeah so i guess a lot of people a lot of people tell me now like and i actually remember i do remember people saying to me then well remember me when you're famous and writing that in my yearbook but i yet i was never someone going yeah i'm gonna be hollywood so i don't know i think if anything i would have said i was gonna be a writer Maybe, but, but but I mean, I did take drama, and people in drama, I remember them saying that. So I don't know. So people, I know I know people thinking, my dad, you know, I always knew you were going to do something. So, but I never went to school for anything. I never had one particular passion of anything that I was going to, you know, other than being an activist. So I don't think anybody would be surprised by the trajectory that got me here, you knew yeah. me back then. But they'd probably be blown away by the levels that I've reached as a result of it. Yeah. So, I mean, think about that for a second. So, you you obviously had some natural talents for this, right? You you had the charisma. Yes. You had, you know, that that big outgoing personality. You had this inner drive that, you know, you wanted to help people um, with the activism. So there were some components there that obviously served you well in, in terms of transitioning into this role. But like you said, maybe your skill is more with the writing so people might not have said oh yeah you're going to be doing interviews on cnn one day talking about you know definitely they wouldn't thought you be talking about the death penalty right that that would have, no. that would have happened yeah that whole thing that trajectory because <laughs> if you interviewed me 10 years ago and googled my name i had a huge public profile on that which is an interesting lesson too because i just realized recently that i've built like twice in my life without meaning to well the second one I mean, I'm a publicist, but I was more doing my work for them. But because I'm always outgoing and I talk about what I do, you know, I started to see how I was building my own brand pretty successfully. Then I jumped in and was going, all right, let's do this thing then in the last eight months, right? But basically, for the first time, without meaning to build myself any kind of built brand, but now twice, twice now, I built like twice in 10 years, I built global brand, like globally recognized brands for myself in two different realms. Because in the death penalty realm, there's like 28 books that quote us, me and my husband. 
that I don't even know how the quote I work for, I read 28 books. Some are like just stupid little drugstore true crime. Others are like scholarly books, like, you know, like about the banality of do, of good ones called. And the other one is, you know, there's one about the, about the international relations between Canada and other con- America and other countries. And we're quoted in it over. Okay. So like we had a huge impact. This is the world, you know, it's a small world after all. It really is. You can have a globe. Like I've twice had a global impact in that crazy. And I was not a lawyer, yeah. but if you Google my name, like a lot of it's covered up now with all this PR stuff because that's the way Google works. Right. But if you looked at me 10 years ago, you would have had 6,000 things all about the death penalty media from around the world. And now, Oh no, clickety click Tracy trick. Now, Oh, global publicist. And now clickety click Tracy trick again, because what I've realized over the last year of doing all this media from podcasts, TV panels about what I taught do and educating entrepreneurs about it. If I wanted to fold up my 10 year PR career tomorrow and stop and never send out another press release, which I never do give up because I mean, the serotonin is fun. Let me tell you. But if I wanted to stop doing that tomorrow and just put it away, I could have a brand new career, career number three, literally doing nothing but public speaking, being flown around the world, standing on stages, educating about why you need to do media, how you need to do media, and then getting flown home at the end of the day and doing nothing. Yeah. So like I've developed, basically, if you look at it that way, because I had no money to do this, not a penny in inter- infrastructure, mm-hmm. not a dollar in investment, mm-hmm. no money in my bank account. I started all this, you know, with, activist heart 20 years ago with that you know jimmy thing and then the internet and then 10 years ago with i started my company again with an old computer and the internet and a bunch of strategy so it's this that stops you imagine if i had a friend that could have invested ten thousand dollars in my little company back then like most of you guys listening have boom 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 i would have been the biggest so we don't stop it's literally this i don't want to sound like one of those guys that gets it goes and trains each other. They all pay each other a million dollars to tell you this, but it's actually true. It all starts yeah. here. And that's the, that's what limits you. It really is a, a, a fact. That's the own limitation. Like what? And then, and also I know it's, you know, a white girl, it's easy to say that, but I mean, no matter what challenges are in front of us, I've seen people who are super privileged, you know, fall apart at a pebble. And then I've seen yeah. people like Jimmy Dennis, a black man who had everything stacked against him 25 years on death row, which but he never lost his focus. He never believed that it was going to get him down. He believed every day that he's going to get out any work to do it. You know, so it, we are obviously all at different levels with different things against us. And so it's easy for me. I don't want to be like, eh, think positive, you know, but if you don't think positive and start that, yeah, you can't ever get rid of that. Even that little pebble is a whole, is a, is literally a, a mountain. So. It's interesting, too, because when you talk about positive thinking, right, this is this is a common mantra in in the self-development world, right? It's like, oh, you have to think positively. But here's the, the catch-22 of positive thinking. It's, yeah. It doesn't matter if you think positively if you don't believe it. And then act in accord. Yep. You have to act. You have to take those actions. So one thing I want to ask you real quick here is when you started your company 10 years ago, you obviously already had some of the skills that you had developed over this time working on Jimmy's case. What skills do you think you had to develop that maybe were a little bit more of a challenge for you starting off and maybe kind of take us through some of the things that you did to develop those skills? Well, so right before I started my company and still wasn't thinking about this, this was the final kind of nail that it made me do the company, which I guess, because otherwise I would have just kept on thinking of it as something I did for the justice and the death penalty. And it would have never even translated as another thing, right? But right in between those two, I started volunteering. Uh, again, I'll volunteer for the 2011 Ontario political um, provincial election. And so, you know, there was a young, I mean, I was a lefty and I still kind of am, but I, I always say the bird can't fly with just one wing and I'm, I'm a, I don't like politics anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, at the time I was, um, but I was you know, hugely passionate about the NDP at that time, which is Canada's left of center party. So we have, in Canada, we have three parties. You know, we have the, the conservatives and then we have the liberals, which are the middle of the road party. And then we have the NDP. So I was, you know, young and, believed everything the NDP said and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, so um, 
the provincial election was coming in and they had a young candidate and I was supporting her and in a little small town, which is really like a conservative town. And I was just being exuberant, Tracy, you know, hey, this is, you know, whatever, uh, Alexandra. And, um, oh no, sorry, we'd been doing like weekly television and that came from our, uh, which sounds like we were like we're just like little community TV where you can go down a little small town and then for a while, hi, interview the guy in the park, eh, you know. So we were doing, we were doing that. So I got kind of a, in this tiny little town, a bit of a public name for myself. As an activist, I wanted to use that for good because I'm like, well, I don't, this is stupid. The celebrity thing is dumb. Everyone wants to take pictures of me when I go to like Tim Hortons in this small town, right? And so if they want to do that, then we're going to like use it for good. So when the election came around, I was like, hey, kids, come on down and support the, you know, all this stuff. So the campaign, so the candidate was like, wow, you know, you've basically been a campaign manager. Will you be the campaign manager? So she had me as, as her campaign manager, which was still just volunteer. But now I had to write press releases and I, and I loved her, but this doing all this made me realize if she gets in, I'm not going to like her so much because then she's going to be in that whole system. And activist me who put my whole heart into this is then going to be like, oh, so that's why I would stop doing all that. But, you know, not nothing because of what she did. She was awesome. But anyways, I was doing press releases there. What? Wait, I'll do a press release. I've never done it before, except for about Jimmy Dennis to the whole world about this. But I guess now I'm going to learn to do it for local media about a local candidate, which is, that's a whole different thing. And I'm just jumping in with both feet because I can do whatever, like a, as a young activist, because we have the hubris of activists. We're going to show that we're, we're not doing this to build a career or that kind of strategy. We're doing it because it has to be done, you know? So we go, <laughs> so we go in with that kind of attitude. Which, and we, with that attitude, we wrote, we did a killer campaign. We got tripled the vote in a conservative riding to the point where the people, the media was in there, like, at first all the signs, you know, the numbers were coming in from the outside of the area, not when, anyway, whatever, it was looking really good for us. They were like, oh my God, they were like shocked, it looks on their faces. Like that. So we, anyway, did, ran a successful campaign that tripled the vote and got really good media, that got people talking, good and bad media, but the kind that got the campaign, the political people coming down from the head office to talk about what was going on in that little town where they thought all of a sudden they had all the support. No, no. They just had us making noise. Boom, boom. So anyway, that taught me, hey, that, that's a whole different game too. Because that's like, now that's not life and death. This is getting fun and strategic. You know, and this is kind of yeah. a game. It's a different angle kind of now. And we're, and I'm playing, you know, the local media and like, and I'm good at it. <laughs> and then I still, I still just do my sales jobs and whatever. And it was still another year before I had that moment going, okay, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I know how to write press releases. I know how to get media. I know how to do all this. I just got to find the people who are going to look at my, you know, 10 years of crazy success of this, but that I was never paid for. And that is, you know, some people might think is edgy, definitely, but who cares? It's, you know, so there was that early on transition where people would Google my name and it wasn't the public they'd find, they'd find that activist, you know, and I first thought, oh, it's going to like, because you wouldn't tell someone to go start a career as a public relations expert, you know, messaging for other people by doing mm -hmm. something and building a whole, whole name for themselves internationally on something that a lot of people think is controversial. That would yeah. be counterintuitive, right? But the early people who saw that, when they would search my name and they'd say, oh, I Googled you, and I'd think, oh, you know, what are they going to say? And you know what? They, I guess if, if they didn't like me, I wouldn't hear from them again. But the yeah. ones I did hear from, one of them I remember saying, you're a real, you know, you're a real go-getter. Somebody else was like, you're clearly a mover and a shaker. So what they saw was like, wow, you were able... Yeah. If you could get yourself known like that, do it for me. And that yeah. allowed me to show what I could do. And now, you know, no one asks me those questions anymore. They see my millions of successes in every realm. And I'm like, sure, okay. <laughs> You're like, I don't care what you did for him. <laughs> and plus now, since then, he's been released. When I started, Jimmy wasn't released. He was still, yeah. now he's been freed. And the world is calling him innocent. He's been in Rolling Stone and BET. So now it's like, oh my God, the PR company that freed an innocent man from death row. And I'm like, oh my God, stop though, because we weren't a PR company. That's a whole di that sounds like a whole different story when you put it that way. Yeah. It was a bunch of dumbass activists. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're like, I know what spin sounds like. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. That's <laughs> exactly. Don't spin me. <laughs> no. If this is going to be a Hollywood story, we don't want no Hollywood. You know, it's already a, rad, a crazy story. We don't need no embellishments. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, the, the thing I love about, about your story, it, there's a couple things that stand out. And, and I want to kind of point these out for people. So first of all is 
at no point did you ever stop and say, well, I can't do this because I don't know how. What you did was you said, okay, what is the bare minimum that I need to learn to do this? And then you got better with it over time. And, and that's something I think a lot of times when we're trying to create habits in our life, we overlook. We think we need to master things before we even start. And that's not how you find success. You find success by making mistakes, messing up stuff, not getting it right the first time, or maybe get, getting lucky and getting it right the first time, right? <laughs> and then you build upon it. So those skills are something you develop over time. So you even talked about how, yeah, I had wrote a press release, but I had never written one for like local media for a politician. So you had to learn a new skill. It was yeah. similar to a previous skill. Yeah. But it was still new. But it was actually new, like a whole different thing yeah. from, yeah. And in a campaign, the heat of a campaign, an election campaign, right? In that, like, it's a different thing than like, hey, Amnesty International, this guy, you know, which they're going to ignore half the time anyway. Because, but, you know, so, yeah, that was a lot of heat, actually. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're on CNN getting interviewed by Nancy Grace. But it's a different kind of heat, like you said, a different kind of thing. Yeah, well, it's also when it's like a passion thing, it, it's a different scenario, right? And I think that's something that's so important for people to really stop and, and think about. And, and I think this just kind of fits in with your whole business thing here, because you're all about branding people. You're all about helping someone to build their personal brand up. And a brand is by definition here, just a perception of what other people have of you. So mm -hmm. when I talk to people about creating habits, one thing I'm always trying to tell people about is like, hey, what is your personal brand? Because your vision is your brand. Tracy's brand is she's the kind of person who helps other people. She's the kind of person who's passionate and enthusiastic. And you can see it during this and hear it if you're if you're not watching the video, if you're uh, listening on a podcast here. But you can hear the energy. You can hear the life in her voice. That's her brand. And that's why she said earlier, it's like when she's talking about the business, she's like, well, it's not really so much about, you know, I'm not going to represent a certain person because it's not my brand. It's because it's not me. And she is the brand. So, you know, when you go to create these habits, you have to think about it in those same terms. Like, it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to go get on CNN because I lost 10 pounds or I reduced my stress. Right. Like, I mean, maybe you could, um, cause there's not a lot of people going to CNN and talking about that, but <laughs> Tr Tracy can probably help you with that. If that's what yeah. you're going to do. <laughs> Watch you, yeah. <laughs> but it does come down to what is that perception that you want? Not just from the outside, but what is the perception that you have of yourself? What is that brand that you're creating for yourself? Because that drives so many of your actions. That drives your willingness to stick with things when they get tough. So I, I took all that out of your story. So I just wanted yeah, to... Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating to hear that. Thank you. I, 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 have, I have a tendency to um, look at people's stories from a slightly different perspective. I guess that's something you can probably relate to because you kind of do the same thing, right? You Yeah, and I was going to say, and it's, it's that, you know what, that exact perspective, right? What you just said. Everyone has their perspective from what they know. You have a really genuine, interesting perspective because you know of your background, your knowledge, what you think of, what you, you what you educate people about. So when you talk to somebody, you see and hear diff completely different things that we may right. Yeah. That right there, if I was working with you, that's your brand. You know, like that's what I would. You already have your brand, but that's what will be part of the pitch because I would. You know, the the more about you is what you have it. When I would, you know, when I say more about. Is what, what's in your bio and on your webpage. But the pitch is, what is he going to say? Why is he going to be interesting to my audience? What does this person bring to the table that's different? So just like me, I don't just say, I'm an international award-winning publicist working across the industry. Because then you'd be like, okay, cool. Yeah. What do you want from me? You know what I mean? <laughs> but I got to give you an idea of what, what I say to the, you know, my part, one of my pitches is she teaches people across industries you know, how to catapult to the top of any industry using PR and media. Another one is, uh, you know, how to build your, uh, build up your self-belief so that you can build up your brand, so that you can build up your communities and change the world. So I always add that even to the hard corporate stuff. I'm like, 
that's great. Build your brand and then <laughs> make your million if that's what you want to do. But then I always add that because I think that's important. That component. So because that's my brand. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. But, you know, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's hugely important that you have to start thinking in that in that sort of mindset. So, Tracy, just to kind of wrap us up here today. Is there anything that you've noticed over the last 10 years of, of helping people get themselves out there? Are there some commonalities that you've seen amongst your really successful clients that, that you that can share That they're willing to listen. Like I would say that they don't second guess stuff. And then I'm not saying that to sound arrogant, but it's like when you hire, you know, you're not an expert in the media space. You're not a, you're just like, I'm not an expert lawyer. When you hire a lawyer, you want to, you're hiring them for their skill and navigating that. Sometimes people will hire you and they'll question and I spend just as much time explaining to them why it's important to do that, even though they might think that has less of an audience and this, or that one is over there. Oh, but that's not in my area and I'm not, I'm here. If I'm presenting this to you, like, I understand it's for a reason. We're building up a thing. This is not an advertising yeah. campaign where you're, your sales campaign where you're, you know what I mean? Doing sort of like, you, it's a strategic thing. And when you're talking about global thought leadership, especially, and even if you're talking about locally, even if you only serve local, a local audience or a local um, customer base, I, what thought leadership is more than what's happening on your street. You want to be quoted in Reader's Digest. You want to be quoted in whatever. So like I'm, I'm here in Canada, even though I work internationally, you know, but I've, you know, I've got clients who like, I've got a client who's a hairstylist in Saskatoon, but he's 50 celebrity, celebrities hire him. Right. Yeah. So when I, I don't talk about him being in Saskatoon, I don't care about the local Saskatoon audience. I do. But the local Saskatoon audience is going to find him when he puts it on his website. When he I, I want it's the global recognition, not the only the Saskatoon Times or whatever it is. You know, we yeah. want him recognized in the Hollywood Times. At first he was like, oh, this is great. I'm in Hollywood Times. But are we going to do something in my local media? I'm like, dude, yeah. After we get Hollywood Times and five other things and then we present it to your local media and they're like, oh, my God. Yeah. And then it's a beautiful big profile. It takes them two pages instead of us begging your local media to pay attention to one of 10 stylists. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, sometimes it's easier to start with the small stuff, and sometimes it's better to start with the big dream, right? It finance just depends. Like, guys, if you look at all the opportunities, you're not like limited to the small stuff. Start with the small, but also hit the large. And that's what we, we like, you know, one person hired me. The next day they were in Good Housekeeping, a print issue, 150 year old magazine american magazine in every checkout counter and for the last 26 year old life coach and for the last two years every single thing she wants to get on to do with mental health as seen in good housekeeping boom 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 built her career on it so it literally just be a matter of reaching out as long as again think about yourself as a source give valuable information and then either find those opportunities or hire publicists i work advertorial for a moment i work internationally in all english speaking you know so yeah but you honestly think about if you have a marketing budget put a little bit of a site even for a month and you know if you work with me and i tell you at the end of me or like you know at the end of a month with the publicist even a month even though we prefer three months and then in the month you have a couple of media spots plus you'd have that pitch you'd have an understanding of advertorial versus editorial you have a basis to even from then on easily work with just doing it on your own so yeah, it's absolutely amazing just what a little bit of recognition can do. Um, you know, just like for myself, you know, having certifications for different things is enough to make me stand out amongst, you know, the crowd. Or like when I was working as a personal trainer, which, you know, such a small part of what I do in the grand scheme of things now. But back when that's all I did. You know, I would blast up my 80 pound weight loss picture and, you know, people would hire me without ever even hearing me open my mouth because they're like, holy crap, this guy lost 80 pounds. So it's the little things that you that you can use to separate yourself. But in order to have those things, you have to go through that framework. You have to create that vision. You have to develop the skills. You have to take the actions, because if you don't. You're not going to be successful. You know, Tracy's story illustrates that for us very well. She had a vision of what kind of person she wanted to be. She went out and developed these skills and looked for opportunities to utilize those skills to be that person. And then she took the actions to develop those skills on a regular basis so that she became that person. And then she stayed open. She looked for opportunities and here we are. So 
it, it's it's a framework that we see over and over again and the great thing about it is you don't need special talents or natural abilities we all can develop skills and we can all take action so that is that's really the, the whole interview in a summary right there we just we just basically just summed it all up so so tracy if someone is interested in working with you what's the best way for them to get a hold of you so they can reach me at uh, LinkedIn is a great place to find me, Tracy Lamori, Facebook Tracy Lamori, um, Tracy Lamori PR Media on Instagram, Tracy Goddess at Twitter. That's an old account name. Um, and if you want to use the old technology, you can use that uh, telephone thing and call me. The Toronto number is 289-788-5881, Beverly Hills number 424-444-8052. All right. And we will also, when we post the interview up on the website, we'll get all that information on the page there as well. So that way people won't have to scramble to go grab a piece of paper right now. Like, crap, I missed it. What was she saying? The number again is, (laughs) my husband would say in radio voice, the number again is (laughs) 289-788-5881. I, I'm not going to lie. I, to this day, every time I leave a voicemail for people, I say my number twice. <laughs> In the radio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this is Steven. My number is da 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 da. Once again, that's a. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for being here today and being so generous with your time and your knowledge. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. I want to thank everyone who tuned in for today and remind you that you can subscribe to the Unshakable Habits podcast on our YouTube channel at unshakablehabits.com slash YouTube or anywhere that your favorite podcasts are played. Until the next time, this is Stephen Box reminding you that you were not created to be average and it is possible for you to take your habits from unsustainable to unshakable. Thanks for listening to the Unshakable Habits Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, please subscribe at unshakablehabits.com slash YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. You can learn more about Unshakable Habits at unshakablehabits.com. Until next week, be unshakable, my friends.